Welcome to the Brand Clarity Podcast, hosted by Visions to Images and Susie Libertor. The Brand Clarity Podcast highlights several different topics, including entrepreneurship, franchises, and digital marketing trends. Visions to Images helps corporations and franchises with their branding, website, paid advertising, and digital marketing. Hello, everybody. Today I have on the podcast Aaron Harper with Rolling Suds, and he is going to talk to you guys about how he acquired a company and then franchised within eight months has 56 locations. And that's super exciting because I know everybody wants to do this. So I'm excited to have him on. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks, Susie. I'm excited to be on with you as well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So give us a little bit of background first and kind of how you got started with franchising. Franchising found me. Uh, I didn't find franchising as as most people uh, are when who come into the franchise industry. Um, I've been in in the franchise industry since 2017. Um, my niche in the uh, in the franchise space is boring businesses. So both of the businesses I've worked on prior to uh, to this one became the biggest in the world while I was there. Mm. So uh, in that specific vertical, so carpet cleaning was the first. A company called ChemDry, which is more of an established brand that does carpet cleaning and floor cleaning. And then that brand was purchased by Belfour, which at the time had three brands and they wanted to scale to a platform company. Mm -hmm. So we merged, we became five brands. We were running their franchise division. They bought a brand called the Patch Boys, which is a drywall repair brand. This was in COVID. They asked me to get involved and help scale that business. And uh, we basically put a bunch of systems in place. And in two years, I scaled that business by 223 locations across the country in 24 months. And what I'm super proud of is they all opened Mm -hmm. and they opened in the same kind of position as the first franchisee that we launched in 2020, which is full-time work hired prior to going to training and the phone ringing at training. So um, we had built some really good systems. We became the biggest drywall repair company in the world. We had also scaled Belfort Franchise Group to 12 brands. So from three, when we got involved to 12, 4,700 locations, 55 countries, we were the second largest conglomerate of home service brands in the world from a unit count perspective. And uh, and then um, they wanted me to take on a 13th brand and help scale it. And it was just a business, not a franchise yet. They wanted me to kind of franchise it, use the infrastructure that we had already built. I decided that I could do that on my own and that I could build a team and I could find a you know, brand that I believe in uh, and raise capital. So in the middle of last year, I started looking at a bunch of different businesses to franchise, HVAC, plumbing, solar, insulation, Um, met the founders of Rolling Suds in September at a franchise conference in um, in Philadelphia. It was the best business I evaluated by far. We finalized the transaction for me to acquire the franchising rights, but partner with them in the franchise entity so that we could replicate their model, 33-year-old power washing business, incredible systems. So we finalized everything in January, started franchising in um, February, and I've uh, now sold as of today, 56 units to um, 19 franchisees in 15 states. And then I'm I'm married. I have a two and a half year old uh, son and an 11 month old daughter, and I live in Nashville. Amazing. I love Nashville. I used to live in Tennessee. Oh, did you? Cool. Yeah, wait a couple of years. But, well, it's more than a couple now. But I loved, I love Tennessee so much. Now I'm in Ohio and I hate it, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I'm closer to family, closer to home, so it's all good. That's good. I'm interested to know, and I'm sure many people are, like how you actually scaled 56 units in eight months. I mean, there's, I mean, obviously you have some multi-unit deals going on here, but how did you find them? I work directly with some of the um, kind of best. Uh, consultants in the industry, uh, workers. Uh, and over the years of working in franchising, I had uh, had those relationships pre-established. Mm-hmm. So in um, in the last brand, when we did 223 units in 24 months, most of them were done with one network mm-hmm. uh, that I'm really close with. Uh, and they trust me. They know that I'm going to take care of franchisees. Mm-hmm. And so they're willing to present the brand, even though it's new and emerging. Sure. They know that with my background, it's not really new. Um, so it's kind of a good opportunity for someone to get into. Also, I built an incredible product. Like I spent eight months back from actually franchising, mm-hmm. building the infrastructure. 
based upon everything I had learned before. So vetting suppliers, figuring out exactly who's going to be successful in my system, um, building a culture, coming up with a, you know, a mission statement that everyone could march toward, figuring out what my 10-year plan, my three-year plan, my one-year plan was. And so I spent a lot of time on the front end building the infrastructure so that when we did launch franchisees, we were in a, a, a position where we could support them. So we have a team now of me plus the founders is 13 people on the team across the country. And you know we're, be- we're basically built to handle a 300 unit system right now, even though we're not there yet. Um, and I did that on purpose. Okay. That's amazing. So what do you typically look for or what's, what should somebody look for when they're looking to purchase a franchisee franchise period? So I, when I work, went into looking for a business to franchise, I had a checklist. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important for anyone who's looking to buy a brand or buy a business or start a business is what are the things that you want to get out of the business and what are the attributes of the business that you want that business to have? Mm-hmm. And it, it removes a lot of the emotion from the decision-making process. I needed something that was recession resistant, had a large total addressable market, a ton of customers are washing every every building that you drive by as a potential customer. I need something that had high margins, um, a different product that is better than the rest of the industry. So we have a proprietary cleaning process where we clean buildings much faster and more effectively. Um, I wanted very little competition in the franchise space. There's no one doing what we're doing nationally. Uh, there's no like serve pro of power washing. It doesn't exist. Right. So we're becoming yeah. that. Yeah. And, and also incredible people like well, anyone who's looking to buy into a franchise, like you're buying into the leadership team, especially when it's an emerging brand. And so you want to look for the right people. You want to make sure that you have the same alignment. And then from my perspective, I know exactly who's going to be successful in the system. And I've turned away now. 26 owners who weren't right that wanted to buy in Uh-oh. would have um, given me a check, uh, but I did not think that they were right for our system. So I turned them away. And I think that's really important for anyone who's a franchisor to make sure that you're bringing the right people in so that they can have success. You're putting the right people in the right seats. I love that you touched on you've turned away 26 people because so many times, I mean, I can relate to this. So many times you want to say yes for the money and or just say yes and I've, I mean, I've listened to many, many people who are like, if you want to be successful, you have to say no a few times, right? right? Especially if they don't meet your mission, your brand, if you don't think they're going to fit. I mean, all that's true. Like we have to vet people as well. So I love right. that you touch on that. And it's not easy to say no, especially to money. But at the same time, it's better to have the people that are going to bring you more income that'll be long term than somebody who doesn't right. puzzle. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, when you're talking about the the first franchisees in a brand, like you're basically joining a startup. Yep. You as the franchisee are now, everything about you is helping build the culture for the rest of the franchisees. So if you have a bunch of franchisees who are in the wrong seats and they're not successful, it's going to be really hard to bring in the people who will be afterwards right. because they all want to talk to the first time franchisees. And if they don't feel like they can relate to that person that they're talking to when they buy into it, they're not going to buy into it. So really everything in franchising has a ripple effect. And so you have to zoom out and say, okay, who's going to be successful in my system? Who am I going to get along with? And and then basically turn away everyone that doesn't meet me. That's amazing. That I love that. I love that. I mean, I've, ta- I've worked with many franchisors and franchisees, and I feel like so many can benefit from what you just said, 100%. So let's talk marketing. What have you done for marketing that you've actually found successful and or not successful? Sure. So um, what we do from a franchise development marketing standpoint is just pretty much work exclusively with consultants and put out a lot of free content online about how to franchise responsibly. So you'll if you follow me on any of my, my yeah. social channels, I talk a lot about responsible franchising. I hashtag it. I think it's really important to highlight that we have a duty to support franchisees. And in order to do that, we have to do it responsibly and know what our role is and also set the proper expectations on what we can actually deliver on and what we can't. And and just be really like completely 100% transparent. And so um, I do that with the consultants. I tell them exactly what we do from a marketing standpoint, from a training standpoint, from a recruiting standpoint, um, all the things we do to support franchisees. They trust me. They then communicate that to candidates. Candidates get introduced to me. They know who I am. They know about what we're about. 
and it helps kind of skip some steps that I otherwise would have had to do if I went with maybe a more organic source on franchise development. Right. And I also do a lot of top of the funnel, like I said, content creation, which really isn't even much about rolling suds. It's more about just franchising in general and and kind of how it's a good path to wealth generation if it's done properly and you find the right brand. So that's what we do from a franchise development standpoint. From a, a, a franchisee standpoint, we have six different marketing agencies that generate leads for franchisees. Four of them are our residential uh, lead generation companies that generate inbound leads to a call center that we have. Mm. Then we have two outbound commercial marketing companies that generate leads for franchisees, and they do outbound marketing to commercial customers. Each of those marketing companies is set up on a pay-per-lead basis. Okay. And then we turn those leads on before they go to training. So residential leads, we turn a week back from training. Commercial leads, we turn a month back from training. We have franchisees out selling jobs before they go to training goal is every franchisee leaves training with jobs on the calendar. That's a pretty good system in place, I would say. I like Thank it. you. So do, Thank you do, you. do you do like any paid advertising or you just stick with these um, components? So the marketing companies that generate leads for franchisees, it's all paid advertising. So they're paying those marketing companies for those leads. Okay. There's Google, there's Facebook, there's a bunch of different strategies. Okay. They just yep. do it in a variety of ways. Hey there, I want to interrupt this episode with a quick message. If you're listening to this podcast episode and want to learn about branding your franchise or small business, then go to brandingbridge.com. That's branding-bridge.com. And I I love how you talked about with Fran Dev, the um, free content and talking about franchising and, and wealth. I think this is kind of what Lance and I talked about, actually, now that it rings a bell, is talking about growing your personal brand. That is so important to me. And that sounds like something that you're doing as well, is just giving out this free content with your name, not really trying to sell, but you're just giving out all this content and talking about franchising and wealth so that people can relate to it and then funnel them in. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm... I'm fortunate in the sense that I'm able to help a lot of emerging franchisors. I, I really like... I think that there's not enough education out there for emerging franchisors. Because typically, I mean, as you know, like in franchising, it's the guy who has an insulation business that wants to franchise and he doesn't know anything about franchising or it's the ice cream shop that wants to franchise, but he doesn't know anything about franchising. And the franchising is a different business. Like for me, it didn't matter if it was power washing or insulation or any of these other things, like the core concepts of how to franchise a business are the same. Absolutely. But they don't have the education necessary to, to, to make the right decisions. And so I get a, an emerging franchisor reaches out to me probably once a week and asks if they if I can help them and tell them how to do do a good job at what they want to accomplish, which is franchise their business. I don't have time to allocate an hour or two hours a week to talk to emerging franchisors. So if I can create content that helps them online, then I can help at scale. So like I'll be I'll be speaking. I'm one of the keynote speakers at the um IFA Emerging Franchise or Conference next week. And so I'll be speaking in front of 300 people for 30 minutes about responsible franchising. And so if I can do that and help at scale, then I feel like there'll be more successful franchisors and then therefore more successful franchisees and then we have more business owners and I think the more business owners we have, the more society and the more interesting society becomes. Absolutely. Um, So my last question for you is, what would be your best advice for somebody who's just getting started in the franchise field? Yeah. So someone who's just getting started in franchising needs to plug into the community and get plugged into other franchisors, meet other like multi-unit franchisees, join the International Franchise Association, go to conferences, and probably honestly do that for a year before you even decide to franchise your business. I was just going to say, like, how do you decide that, right? Because so many times people want to just jump right in and then they don't always get the results or they fail too too soon and then they want to give up, but they keep going. But you know what I mean? Like they have these obstacles that keep coming in the way because they just want to grow so quick. The other thing that I'll say is don't franchise unless you have a lot of money in the bank in order to go towards it. Like million plus, I would say. And it depends on whether you're, I'm writing this, I'm working on my speech on this. So you need to figure out exactly how long is it going to take you to get a unit open mm-hmm. and to the point where they're cash flowing. And and then 
only sell the amount of units that fit back into that number and then only sell the amount of units that you can that actually feasibly support on the back end with that. And then also, you know, a lot of the franchisors who come in, they might hire a franchise sales organization or this or right. do that. And they're not going to have much of their franchise fee left over. So they even need more capital above and beyond. And so really you have to back into what is it going to take to get these franchisees to like cash flow positivity? Because ultimately that's what matters. I I talk to franchisors sometimes and they're like, I really want to open like six franchisees a a year. And I'm like, how much money do you have to go towards franchising? And they're like $40,000 or $70,000. And like, I get that often. And that's not enough money. Mm. Like they might spend two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars before they've even found a franchisee, first franchisee. I believe it. Yeah. I mean, I mean you know, alone is a lot of money too. I mean, just legal alone is going to be bet- with operations manual between twenty five thousand yeah. to a hundred thousand, and then all the broker networks and all the you know the the PR and the leads that go into finding the franchisees. That's another two hundred. You know what I mean? So like that's before you've even sold a unit. And so it, it also depends on how many franchise, how many locations you want to sell, right? Like if it's like, if it's like, oh, I want to open one or two, and I know exactly what it's going to take to make sure they're successful, then just do that. But I talk about this sometimes, like think about it from this perspective. If I decided tomorrow mm-hmm. that I wanted to build a $10 million HVAC business, but I have no experience in HVAC, think of how much capital and time it would take for me to figure out how to start an HVAC business from scratch. And when you're a franchisor, you're starting a franchise from scratch. Even if you have the franchise experience, it's still, and I talked to somebody else last week or whatever, you have to look at it differently. Like Fran Dive and franchisor versus the franchisees are so different. Well, you have to figure out how to support franchisees. So you need to zoom out and know what they need from you. Then you have to create systems around those things and you need an LMS, you need a mapping software, you need a CRM for franchisees and all these things, you need digital assets, you need physical assets, like all these things have to be created before you even decide to franchise. I have franchise experience. I've right. go back years back, I've placed over 475 units into three brands in six years. So I know what systems I need to build to make sure we can get to 300 units safely and responsibly. So, but I still raised lots and lots of money to do this the right way because we're not producing royalties for a period of time until they get to a point where they're profitable. And, and that could be three months. It could be two years, depending on the model. And so, so you tell, have to build your thing around that. So tell me, you said this two times now, and I feel like I should ask this before we um, get off. You talked about raising capital. What, what is that defined for you? And how did you do that? So I have mentors in the franchising industry who have scaled businesses, franchise systems by hundreds of locations. And they approached me Mm -hmm. in the middle of last year and said, Aaron, I'll invest in you, Mm -hmm. whatever business you want to franchise. And I'm in it for the long haul. So it's not private equity money. Mm -hmm. It's not like I need my money out in three years. It's I'm investing in you long term. You need more money in the future. Call me. And so I modeled out, okay, if I sell this many units and I get this many units open and those franchisees start at an average monthly revenue of this and they increase every month by a percent, then my, and I have this GNA and these expenses, then my ROI on, on this will be this in five years. And I did all of that work. And so I raised more than the amount of money that I needed to get to kind of the profitability point. Now, the way we operate, I've been profitable since March. Mm-hmm. So we were profitable a month after we we right. launched, but that's because I knew exactly how to get there. If I didn't have that kind of intellectual capital, it would take a lot longer and a lot more actual capital to to truly get to the point where you can support franchisees. So I raised from people who could provide mentorship in addition to capital to answer your question. That's interesting. I like it because I mean, I've heard of like the the private equity and the venture capital and all of these little different terms. And I've heard of all of that. So I was just curious as to how you raised it because you can do so many different things. So, right. Well, thank you for sharing. If anybody wants to learn more or connect with you, what's the best way to have them find you? Yeah. So just go to rollingsudsfranchise.com and submit your best information or schedule a call form on there and it'll go directly to me.
and we can chat. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, everybody, for listening in on today's Brand Clarity episode with Susie Libertor. Two things. First and foremost, please, if you liked this episode, please subscribe and leave some positive reviews. Also, don't forget to sign up for Stop Sending Your Customers to the competition and get my insider secrets to compelling branding that converts. You can find that at branding-bridge.com. It's a free workbook for you to check out right now all of the branding techniques and strategies that I use for my paying clients.